Thank you for joining the Jefferson Educational Society's digital program, EREPA and Lublin, Poland. Opportunities and threats in a changing world economy. I'm Angela Bowman, Director of Programming at the Jefferson. Folks, as we begin today's event, I'd like to remind everyone tuning in that we are taking your questions via the comment section on Facebook. If you have a question, please share it there as we'll work our way through as many questions from you as we can. I'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Bruce Kibler and Dr. Pavel Pazjabiak for presenting their research findings today. Dr. Kibler has a master's degree in German language and literature from the University of Maryland College Park and in business and information technology from Johns Hopkins. He has a PhD in strategic and international management from Matei Bell University in the Slovak Republic. After a successful career in the business world where he worked in large projects, such as the acquisition of VoiceStream, now T-Mobile, and the business transformation of Croatia Telecom, Professor Kibler moved into academia. At Gannon University in Erie, he champions community engagement via class projects, uniting student learning, community involvement, and economic develop development, championing the alleviation of food deserts, fiber optic to the home, the creation of a land trust, and much more. Professor Kibler has forged partnerships with international universities in Essling, Germany, and Lublin, Poland, Erie's sister city. He has recently become more active in sustainability and economic development, specifically engaging with Africa Green Tech to bring solar solutions to sub-Saharan villages. Dr. Perzerbiak is the head of the Department of World Economy and European Integration at the Institute of Economics and Finance, Maria Curie Slodowska University, UMCS, in Lublin, Poland. In his research, he focuses on the phenomena and processes taking place in the global economy with particular emphasis on the area of international trade and investment. He also focuses on processes of regional economic integration, particularly in the area of Asia Pacific. As part of the project SPEAC, the Jean Monnet Network, with scientists from South Korea, Singapore, Germany, and Sweden, he is researching the connectivity between Europe and Asia. Also under the European Academic Exchange Program Erasmus+, he cooperates with Gannon University EAPA. Dr. Perzebiak is the author and co-author of numerous scientific papers, books, and book chapters, and lectured in numerous universities in Germany, Japan, Spain, and the United States. The speakers published an article in 2017 concerning the two cities, their development and trajectory, and presented their findings at the Jefferson Educational Society. They are returning today to update their analysis of Erie in Lublin since that time. Lublin has faced many changes since 2017, the effects from Brexit to changing political regimes and um, being the closest major Pol Polish city to, the to Ukraine, taking in many thousands of refugees. Erie has changed as well, having seen major developments in its downtown and surrounding areas, from the new Erie Insurance Building and many other new construction projects downtown. All through this, both cities have had their challenges in demographics and the still threatening coronavirus. What strategies are these two cities pursuing, if any? Join us for a look at these exciting and international perspectives. With this, I'd like to hand over to you, Dr. Kibler, to begin the presentation. All righty. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate being invited to the Jefferson and being able to speak. And, and, and hello to Pavel as well. I haven't seen you in a while. So um, we're going to take you through a, 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 some statistics uh, today, uh, and, and then we're going to actually you know, talk about you know, the actual, some of the actual developments. And we're all going to be talking about kind of some systemic comparisons of, of, you know, between Lublin and Erie, or the US and Europe, if you will. Um, first of all, I would like to just start off by, uh, you know, a short introduction of the, the sister city aspect of this. Um, you know, the sister cities is an international, uh, you know, group of independent organizations. They have, there's no set management structure that they have. 
Uh, they're usually run by volunteers and representatives uh, of, of institutions like the Chamber of Commerce or here the uh, Manufacturers and Business, uh, business uh, um, Association. Usually, you know, they're centered around the municipal government. Um, and a lot of them actually, you know, found their own nonprofits as a 501c3. Um, you know, the we we have found none of these things actually uh, in in Erie. Uh, um, it, it's it's a much looser um, organization or partnership, if you will. Um, and as far as we could find, uh, really, the relationship between Erie and Lublin just goes back to the 1960s, and a you know a personal relationship uh, between you know the administrations that existed at that time. But no formal organization has actually ever been uh, created uh, to to further the sister cities. Um, and th this, uh, uh, you know, because of all of that, uh, basically uh, a, a delegation from Berlin came uh, to Erie. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just going to guess and I say it was about nine, maybe 10 years ago, uh, at which time, you know, it kind of got a little bit, you know, revitalized. Uh, and I think it was that very same year that actually um, uh, Professor Pasiewiak and, and myself were both teaching uh, at a university, a summer class uh, in the uh, University of Kassel in Germany, where we met uh, and we talked about the delegation that had come uh, to Erie. And he said, yes, I knew about that. I said, yes, I knew about that too. And, and we kind of picked it up and started trying to do, do a little bit more with it. And, and, and resulting in that was our first presentation, uh, a couple of other things, uh, the cooperation, which has become more formalized through uh, your European uh, grant money. Uh, and here we're doing our, our second presentation. We've done some other publications as well. So, but it was a lot of happenstance, you know, brought us to, to this, uh, uh, this day. So, and so we're starting our presentation uh, um, uh, with Erie. And so we're gonna go through a statistical review of what's kind of been happening. Uh, we'll do a little bit more um, interpretation uh, of this, you know, after both of the presentations of the statistics. So, you know, just to start off, uh, and this is where I started the, uh, the first presentation back in 2017 as well as, just an overall look at you know what's really kind of going on in many many ways, and and one of the things that is really interesting, and I would like you to keep in mind as we as we go through, um, is that there's a, an overall um, movement or or uh, you know transformation going on, and that is quite literally the movement of wealth to a, an ever smaller group of people. Uh, and this has happened through, you know, what's called financialization. Uh, and so more, you know, the, 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 the wealth of, of very specifically the US, but pretty much all Western societies uh, is aggregating to a greater and greater degree to a smaller and smaller group at the top. And you know, I'm I'm not putting any value uh, statement on that. You can think of that as you like, whether you think that's good, bad, or indifferent. But there are repercussions uh, to that, um, and and we will speak a little bit to that, uh, uh, you know, at the uh, end. So, and one of the, one of the the big pieces of that, however, is uh, the fact that it, you know a lot of that aggregation of wealth into those fewer hands means that those people are no longer actually reinvesting in infrastructure because infrastructure is not a very highly profitable uh, investment. It's, it's very long-term, it's you know, very low uh, return on investment. And so what all that means is that as that money goes to those fewer and fewer people, less money is being invested in the infrastructure, which means that the reliance on government to do those things becomes greater and greater uh, as we, you know, actually, I mean, it, almost everywhere, I don't know of any country that doesn't, you know, think uh, you know, that the government is really impeding things where in fact, you know, with the systemic change of wealth to that smaller group that doesn't want to invest because they don't make the money in the infrastructure, then the only person that's, or entity that's going to do it is government. Um, so, and, and that's, you know, 
again, you, you can think of that as you will, uh, but uh, there is, it's problematic. Uh, if, if you don't think we should have government, then, you know, then it, it's, you know, so where's the money going to come from for a lot of this economic development? And this is this is just a series of of, of uh, graphs that uh, you know show you that wealth is being accumulated to a greater and greater degree to to smaller groups uh, of of and this is all just the USA. So you know, and you see like, you know, gro glo gro global income and wealth. Here's a global and, and wealth inequality. So the amount of money accumulating, uh, uh, you know, to a smaller group of people. You know, that's the top 10% of people in the world own 76% of all the wealth. And, and again, let's be clear about this. Infrastructure is not a good investment for people looking to make money because it is long-term and it is low payback. Uh, and so individuals tend not to want to invest in that. And that has a lot to do with you know the short termism that is very endemic in the spe specifically in the U.S. is that I mean if, if if you're looking at a balance sheet and quarterly results, then there's no way that you're ever going to invest in infrastructure <clears throat> because you don't have a return on investment in a period of time or in a, in an amount that is going to justify according to the financial markets that we use, the investment itself. So looking at, uh, uh, at, at Erie a little bit, our employment situation over time, um, I mean, it, it doesn't look horrific, um, but we do see, okay, you know, you see that, you know, the pandemic had an effect on there. Uh, um, and, and uh, but we have also not come back to uh, uh, you know, pre-pandemic levels. <clears throat> and uh, as we see also that the, the manufacturing employment has consistently been going down uh, and the non-farm employment uh, has actually be, been trending more up, but that took a, a, a pretty, um, you know, big nosedive uh, at the pandemic. It is recuperating, recuperating somewhat at this time. Uh, and then we'll see where that is. You see that, you know, here we see also that, you know, the big growth is in education and health services, whereas there's really no other area that is, you know, trending up. Uh, um, and then we have some little tick upticks here uh, in trade transportation. Uh, uh, manufacturing is totally leveled off right now. Uh, leisure and hospitality, again, big dip. Uh, um, for the beginning of the pandemic and is recuperating at this time. Professional services, uh, you know, uh, again, going down. We have some financial activities that also look to be tending upwards. Uh, but again, that's not a lot uh, overall. Um, mining and logging, we have a little uptick uh, on that as well. Um, you know, but, you know, information, which is uh, again, part of this would also be things like cybersecurity, which is something that's being invested in greatly in Erie right now. Uh, there is, you know, not an uptick in in, in jobs uh, in in that area. So all in all, um, you know, it's it's not it, it doesn't look hor horrific. It's a transition. We, you know, you can see here that you know Erie the the basis of Erie's economy is changing. And we're changing away from, you know, more predominantly uh, manufacturing to much more education and health services. And again, you know, uh, I'm not going to put a value on this, you know, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. It's at this point, you know, we're just looking at the actual changes that are going on. And we see here that the manufacturing has, you know, changed. We have not dropped. Uh, um, you know, to the, you know, overall, you know, U.S. or Pennsylvania levels. So our manufacturing sector is still stronger than uh, Pennsylvania in general or the U.S. in general. Uh, and, and again, we can we could talk about, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly uh, or, or the, the great uh, about that. There's good things about it. There's bad things about it. Um, you know, this plays to, you know, a larger uh, aspects 
of our economy and the fact that America in general has moved away from a lot of manufacturing because we sent that off into outsourcing and offshoring to places like China. Uh, um, oh, sorry. There we go. Um, and, and again, I mean, you know, let's let's be candid here. We sent that to China. We we are the ones who built China uh, uh, as the West by sending that manufacturing over there uh, to keep costs down for ourselves, but not just cost down, but profits high. Because as I send manufacturing, manufacturing is, you know, for all, uh, one of the most important aspects of manufacturing is what's called sunk costs. Uh, and again, that's long-term investment in things like factories, okay? And those are things that are assets that just sit on a financial, on your financial uh, um, um, balance sheet uh, that, again, you know, they're, they, they just sit there and they're, they're more of a liability than they are you know, productive. And if I can, if I can eliminate the asset from my balance sheet and ha just have the profits, then of course my business looks much better. And that's why outsourcing is, you know, make, makes a balance sheet look much better. And this is what we in America and most you know, Western societies have done as we have outsourced so much of that because that takes that asset of those physical things that I own as a manufacturer off of my books. And so, but I still have the revenues on the other side. And so that means I look a lot more productive than I actually am. Um, so, and again, you know, we'll talk about, we can talk about whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. But in Erie, we have a, still have a higher uh, manufacturing base than most of the other, uh, uh, well, most of the other states uh, in the US uh, in general. Um, that is uh, the major, um, manufacturing in Erie is also still plastics. So, and we'll talk about that at, uh, towards the end as well. Um, and looking at the, uh, uh, you know, the overall, um, you know, real median household income, you know, Erie versus uh, Pennsylvania versus the USA, as it were, well, we're clearly not, you know, uh, you know, keeping up per se, um, but we are still increasing at this time. Uh, even though it is nominal and we're, it looks like we've reached about the same level as we had in 2017. Um, so there was some drops there, but that also has to do with, I mean, we've also lost population, which we'll see uh, in, uh, I can't remember, one or two more slides. So again, you know, when you see that, you know, the household income is increasing, then you know, the, one of the interpretations of that, of course, is that if we're losing population, what type of population are we losing? Are we losing the really high income or are we losing the low income? Uh, and that, of course, you know, gives you way, different ways to interpret what these numbers mean. So if we're losing, you know, people from the lower income, uh, then basically, the uh, the income you know median income per uh, household is going to go up because there's fewer low low income people being factored into that statistic. And here we we look at it you know uh, more in terms of you know where are we going uh, uh, you know we're so we have it looks as if we have um, you know lost more higher income people in. Erie County, which is interesting. I mean, that actually bodes well for, you know, at least, you know, the, the middle and lower classes. That means that more, if, 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 if that income is rising, then it's actually rising, you know, in real terms. So if we're, you know, only, you know, rising for the uh, $100,000 incomes or more, then there's more people that are lower than that, that that are getting money uh, as well. So if the median is going up and we see that the proportion here is going more to the uh, uh, like the middle middle class and and lower class uh, um, income people. Although I, 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 I'll take that back. I don't mean lower or middle class. I just I just lower earning or or um, you know more medium earning people class has nothing to do with it. 
Um, there was a significant impact of COVID uh, here in Erie. We lost a, a lot of jobs. Uh, and uh, we also have lost, you know, people, not just, you know, uh, um, people, people also died from COVID, uh, but we've lost a number of people. Uh, and so our employment is actually looking, you know, not bad. This is, this is eerie employment. So our employment is actually looking, you know, fairly decent. We, but we lost a lot of jobs uh, and, and uh, through the pandemic. 26,000 is the estimate uh, that comes from Bureau, Bureau of uh, Labor and Statistics. And, you know, here, uh, you know, a tip of my hat also to the people at Penn State Barron who put a lot of this uh, um, information together. So, and here's just a comparison. We have, uh, you know, we only lost 8,300 jobs in the Great uh, Recession back in 2009, uh, but we lost 26,000 jobs during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, again, the unemployment rate has gone down uh, uh, dramatically uh, between April of 2020 and May of 2020 which is good news. But again, I mean, if we look at, uh, and, and here we have an inflation uh, uh, by major, major category, energy is the number one thing that's been hitting people, but food is also up 10.4%. And if you remember, I mean, uh, the amount uh, that we were looking at before, income you know, only has gone up about a half a percentage point. So, you know, even if it were one or two percent, you know, we're clearly not keeping up with any of this inflation at all. Um, so all items together, less the food and the energy here, which are the biggest categories of inflation, um, it's been 5.9 percent. But again, uh, you know, that doesn't, 5.9 percent is actually in, relatively insignificant. Uh, unless you're, I mean, you know, you're, you know, a, a very low income uh, family. And then, of course, that that means a lot. You know, I mean, if, if something costs uh, 2% more for somebody, you know, earning $25,000 a year, that's a very different uh, uh, scenario than a 2% increase for somebody making $100,000 a year. Um, you know, so again, you know, uh, what does it mean? It means different things to different people. Uh, and here we see, you know, and, and it was a couple of slides more than I thought, but we have a, a significant decline in population. Um, and, and again, you know, some of that is, I mean, it, it's across the board. I don't have any specific information as to what the demographics are of the people um, that are leaving. Um, so I, I can't make any correlations uh, between, you know, uh, how... If our income is going up, is that, you know, the, the higher income people are leaving or is it, you know, are lower people, lower income people leaving? So uh, there's no conclusions that we can actually draw from here other than the fact that, you know, uh, with a, a significant loss of population, that is going to clearly mean that uh, usually, um, you know, our, our unemployment statistics will look better because there are few, fewer people applying for those jobs. And, you know, again, just going back to the same uh, look that we heard that uh, fewer, fewer people, uh, but we're also, you know, we have a lot fewer jobs right now because we lost, again, 26,000 uh, some odd jobs uh, through the pandemic. Um, and we'll see, you know, to what extent that's actually going to end up rebounding. And, and, and again, we don't know at this point. So, uh, but a lot of things are going on, which we will talk about a little bit later. And now I will hand it over to Pavel. Oh, yes, Pavel, you can already control my screen. So uh, hand it over to Pavel Fasiliak uh, to uh, talk about Lublin. Okay, thank you, Bruce. I hope you can hear me. Uh, first of all, thank you, Jefferson, for inviting uh, us for this presentation. And uh, it is my, I think, second time that the first one was six years ago and it was in person <laughs> so um yes um 
Uh, city of Lublin, Lublin, uh, a sister city of, of Erie. Um, it is uh, kind of a medium sized city in, in eastern Poland. Uh, you, you can see the, the flag and, and coat of arms here and on this slide. Uh, actually, it's a uh, capital of um, Lubelski region or Lubelski voivodeship. It's kind of a state like in comparison to, to the United States, but of course, it's much smaller. Uh, and it is, uh, I think, ninth uh, biggest city in Poland. So it's kind of a medium-sized city, as, as mentioned. Uh, but it's kind of important uh, center for eastern part of Poland. Uh, it's important, for example, academic center. Um, and we are also kind of significant transportation hub that connects Western and, and Eastern Europe also. And as Bruce also mentioned, uh, Lublin is located quite near to Ukrainian border. Uh, so it has some consequences nowadays uh, in, in this uh, hard uh, situation with, with the war in Ukraine. Um, OK, oh, it works. Uh, just to give you some impression that we are quite vibrant city, I, I would say. Uh, we've been granted uh, um, European Youth Capital title. So next year, 2023, we will have uh, <clears throat> this title and, and a lot of uh, events uh, are be organizing in the city. Uh, so um, yeah, it is kind of a proof that we are doing quite well, of course, with some, uh, some problems too. And I mentioned them, uh, of course. Uh, but it's quite a uh, prestigious um, like, uh, thing for, for, for us, and we are happy about that. Uh, and uh, yes, as, as we saw the, the picture of Erie, which, is, uh, which was really, really nice and uh, interesting, uh, I would also like to share the, the picture of Lubin city center. Uh, of course, if we could go back 20 years ago, it uh, wouldn't look like that. Uh, so this is also kind of a mm, um, proof of, of progress we've made. Uh, so uh, it's it's it looks like like uh, a European well-developed city. I, I think. Um, yeah. So uh, this is uh, this is uh, Lublin in, in more general. Uh, okay. And uh, now I would like to talk a little bit about some general environment in which the Lublin uh, was developing. Uh, of course, uh, as uh, Angela mentioned, we have written the article in 2017 and the time scope was uh, from the beginning of, of the 90s. And I think it, uh, it should be mentioned that uh, it's, uh, uh, it's um, mm, this long period of time uh, has changed uh, our city a lot. Um, okay. Was it me that was changing? Um, okay. So it should be like that. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the beginning of the 90s, it was the, the really important uh, period for not only for Poland, but, but also for uh, some um, Eastern European countries, as well as uh, Western European countries, uh, because uh, it was the beginning of the transformation uh, period. Uh, we transformed our, our politics, our economies, our society. So it was kind of very important uh, factor influencing all activities we, we, could, we could have. So it was, it was a, a really important um, time. Uh, it was, and it was the beginning because uh, we can uh, discuss if the transformation period just uh, ended or, or not but uh, it was the beginning. And then um, we had some uh, conditions in which the Polish city could develop. And uh, I, I should mention about some uh, geopolitical changes. And geopolitical changes meant that uh, we had to uh, create democratic system uh, from the very beginning, from the scratch, actually. So we had to create some structures, uh, state structures, based on, on 
uh, tripartite division of power, legislative, executive, and, and judi uh, judicial. Uh, so check and balances. And it was not, not very easy. So it was the, the process that started there. Um, then we had, of course, some um, uh, adoptions of democratic systems. So it, it meant that uh, we uh, rejected uh, somehow uh, the um, centrally planned economy and socialism, and we moved to our democratic system. So it was kind of a, a huge change in, in that time. Then uh, we had also uh, changes in economic model. So uh, I don't have to tell you about some uh, problems with uh, socialism and centrally planned uh, managed economy. Uh, we changed uh, to uh, economic uh, or market system. Uh, so it was again uh, something new for us and, and uh, we had some uh, difficulties at the beginning with, with that. Um, yeah, and and it was quite a huge change for us too. Uh, of course, it wouldn't be possible that all these changes wouldn't be possible um, without the political environment and in, in Europe and in the world. And of course, the United States were uh, were involved here and Western European countries. So this support uh, allowed us to uh, to move forward. And uh, like at the end of this. Uh, uh, transition, we could say, uh, or the, the, the proof of the transition that took place was accession to the European Union uh, that confirmed that we are quite well prepared um, to, to that. So we also had an access to, to the market, to, uh, to EU funds. Uh, so it also accelerated the social economic transformation of, uh, of uh, the country. Uh, and it created the, uh, the uh, environment in which uh, cities could develop. So all these uh, factors I mentioned uh, led to modernization of Polish economy. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we could measure it and I show you some, some data as we are economists, we have to use some numbers to prove our, our faults and, and our uh, claims. Uh, but uh, nowadays we are facing another um, uh, factors and the environment has changed. So we are talking about the pandemic and war in Ukraine and it will have of course serious consequences for, uh, for our uh, city and our economies. Um, but also we are talking about more um, active approach of our uh, self-government, uh, local government. So activities taken on the, on the city level like creation and implementation of strategies is very important. So as said, uh, I would like to just briefly show you some kind of achievement we, we made. Um, uh, if you look at this uh, figure, uh, you can see the, the Poland, which is the red line, uh, and uh, the blue one is the United States. We, we've got also world and European Union, but. Uh, as you can see at the beginning for 1990, it was minus 11% the GDP growth. So actually it was not growth. Uh, but then uh, we moved and uh, for almost entire period, except for 2020 pandemic, um, of course, we had uh, uh, advantage over all these uh, selected uh, economies. Uh, so we were developing quite dynamically, I would say. Uh, and the data confirmed that. Um, as GDP is quite, uh, you know, the, the, the general uh, indicator of, of economic activity, we could go into details and some find some uh, another indicators. Um, I'm not sure, but probably this presentation will be also available for, for you on, on the website or Upon, upon request, uh, so I won't talk about all these numbers, don't worry, uh, but maybe I would um, show you or, or emphasize the, the improvement we've made. Uh, and if we look, for example, at the GDP in, in US dollars, in billions of US dollars, so 1990, it was 66 only, uh, and now we have almost 600. Of course, if we compare it to the United States, it's uh, very, very low. 
Uh, but if you look at the change uh, from 1990 and 2020, we have, uh, you know, the, the increase of uh, eight, 800%. The uh, United States had 250. So again, <clears throat> we, we had, a, you know, we progressed. The same for GDP per capita. Of course, uh, it's not uh, huge in comparison to the United States or even the European Union. Uh, but still, the progress was made uh, from less than 2000 to almost 16 in, in 2020. So again, 800% uh, growth. Of course, it's a long period, 30 years. And the beginning was, at the beginning, was very small. So probably from that point of view, like from statistical base, uh, also is uh, responsible for these numbers. But uh, in comparison to, to some other countries, we did quite well. Uh, as for another uh, indicator, which is inflation, uh, we are talking about inflation uh, all the time nowadays, but look at uh, Poland in 1990, we had uh, inflation around 600%. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, some experience with that, uh, bad experience, but uh, look at uh, the numbers later. So 2005, 2.1, uh, and even 2015, we have you know, we have um, uh, negative inflation, right? Uh, so uh, again, the progress was made here. Uh, unemployment uh, again, almost 18 uh, percent uh, of unemployment, and nowadays it's 3.4, uh, something like that. So again, the progress was made. Um, yeah, the United States uh, probably they, you, you you didn't have such problem. Of course, you had some, some experience with uh, unemployment, uh, as also Bruce uh, showed us, uh, but, but um, it was not as high as, as in Poland. And uh, just to uh, end on the stables, uh, you can see the exports. Export increased by more than 2,250%. Uh, in the United States, it was less than 350 um if we look at the fdi inflow uh, the increase was even even higher so there are some data that confirm that poland did well and it made uh, the environment favorable for uh, for development also development of the of the cities so uh, we could also go talk about uh, you know the uh, conversion Effect and uh, because of this GDP growth, we we have um, reached the, the certain level of, of uh, um, less developed Western European uh, countries. Uh, so we we managed to, to develop a little bit. Of course, a lot of in front of us, but but still. Uh, and then uh, let's uh, go to Lublin, and Lublin is. Uh, Okay, yes. Uh, as said, uh, it's a, a medium-sized city. Uh, we have, uh, as for 2021, we have 336,000 uh, citizens. Uh, the number that dropped from the beginning of the period we analyzed. Um, so this is uh, like a um, negative change, and uh, this is the, the major problem, I, I guess, for, for Lublin, not only for Lublin, uh, I, I think. And what's also uh, more uh, worrisome is uh, that the structure of the population has changed in a negative way, because uh, we lost uh, pre-working age population that dropped by uh, 25%. Uh, this is a huge drop. And we Lost also working age uh, population dropped by 10%, and post working age population increased by almost 100%. So this structure structure of population uh, is not that good. It's of course connected to aging, and uh, it is not only Lublin, not only Poland, Europe, but it's almost all over the world, maybe except of Saharan Africa. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is the situation of population in, in Lublin. Uh, these are the same data shown on, on, on the chart. So you can see the changes that took place. Uh, and yes, so this will also uh, um, 
you know, require a certain policy, a certain approach towards tackle, to, to, to tackle, to handle this problem. Um, as for uh, the economy of um, um, maybe last last chart uh, about about uh, the demography, uh, because I, I also mentioned that it's one of the, the most important problems for Lublin. Uh, so the projections are not uh, optimistic. So uh, even in comparison to Poland, the situation of Lublin is going to be worse, uh, a little bit worse, more worse than, than in Poland. Uh, and of course, it affects the, the size of economic potential and possibilities for, <clears throat> for Lublin to develop. But uh, it also uh, is an indicator for policy makers uh, at the local level to make an effort to uh, to reverse to some some extent that that uh, tendency. It's not very easy, of course, uh, but uh, some actions should be done. We'll talk about that later. Um, okay, and uh, as for uh, structure of uh, employment in, in uh, Lubanski Wojtoczyk, it's uh, for, for the region. Uh, it's uh, Lublin region is a rather rural agricultural region and you can see it on, on the chart, uh, but it is not Lublin city, it's entire region. So uh, we've got here around 23, 24% employed in agriculture. Then we have around 23% in uh, industry and, and the rest is uh, services, uh, but uh, services are around 60%. Um, if we look at uh, Lublin, the situation changes um, because uh, yes, the services are increasing and in that, um, uh, in that um, uh, situation and uh, also we have uh, industry that is quite important and as for agri agriculture or forestry and fishing uh, such category we have less than five percent so uh, again uh, Lublin is a city where uh, where um, people work mostly in services and, and uh, in manufacturing uh, all whole entire region is per perceived as a, uh, as a agricultural region. Uh, and as for wages, uh, Lublin is uh, not that in a, that good situation, uh, even in comparison in, in Poland. Uh, and uh, this um, green uh, green areas are the, the uh, monthly wages in, in Lublin. They are growing, but uh, actually they are lower than um, Poland's average. So uh, the situation is not not that good. Uh, of course, I'm not com I'm not comparing it with uh, uh, with uh, wages of uh, of US um, or even in Erie. Uh, as for unemployment, we are in quite a good situation. Uh, even in the pandemic, we had a situation where the unemployment was low, uh, and in Lublin it was around five percent. The same for Poland. Um, so. In that uh, sense, the situation uh, is, is quite uh, good. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, I had one slide, I think, um, left uh, about. Oh, okay, so I, I talk about uh, the, the situation during pandemic. Uh, during pandemic from uh, the March. Uh, 2020 to uh, February 2021, um, our unemployment increased by uh, 0 0.9 percentage point. So, of course, uh, it increased, but the increase was not that dramatic like in the United States. So, I would say that the situation in, in Lublin as for labor market is quite, quite stable and uh, yeah, we've got uh, some um, problems, economic problems uh, connected to uh, connected to uh, demography that will uh, cause uh, necessary adjustment uh, on the uh, supply and, and demand side. So this is this is probably what I 
I wanted to tell you about Lublin, some, some data. And now, uh, yeah, I think I will pass screen to Bruce, right? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I'll apologize to you, Pavel. Perhaps I uploaded a, a previous version and, and missed one of your slides. I'm, I apologize for that if that's what happened. So um, I did want to, you know, talk uh, very briefly about, I mean, because, you know, we could concentrate on a lot of negative stuff. Uh, I mean, you know, it's not, you know, all rosy, uh, um, you know, as we saw before. Uh, there's a lot of parallels. Uh, between uh, uh, Lublin and, uh, and and Erie, you know, we're both growing in the you know the leisure uh, and uh, uh, services sectors, and and for us, healthcare, education uh, are all areas that are growing, whereas manufacturing is decreasing. Uh, I did want to talk also just very briefly about uh, some of the projects that are going on. I mean, there's there's a lot of you know, and again, we can look at this through many different lenses. Uh, um, and there's uh, um, a lot of uh, um, this. This is the set of projects uh, that is uh, coming out of um, you know a a, a new group uh, um, you know uh, here in Erie um, you know being headed uh, by Bruce Katz from uh, uh, you know who well, used to be formerly of the Brookings Institute and I believe he is now independent, uh, but he's working with a lot of the local people here. In uh, you know trying to tie together a lot of the we have a lot of different plans in Erie uh, from you know, Erie Downtown Development Corporation to you know the West Side to you know just Downtown Erie or, and and then Erie larger the East Side's got a plan uh, the West Bay Friends got a plan and this is this is another plan uh, <laughs> it does tie a lot of things together uh, there's a lot of really good stuff going on here I, I highlighted some that I thought were were really really good. Uh, um, you know, uh, although one can, you know, also discuss, you know, the good and the bad, and and then I think that's important to keep that in mind is that not everything is positive of this. You know, uh, um, you know, this this is all based on basically, uh, you know, money that uh, we we are uh, going to be getting into Erie uh, from the American Rescue Plan, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs uh, Act, and the Competes Act. Um, and, and I guess, you know, the, the first thing that I would really like to, to mention there, and it's, you know, in my uh, points at the bottom, uh, is that, you know, uh, if, if you think about it, okay, these are all acts from the federal government, okay? Uh, so what that means is that none of this has anything to do with capitalism. This is almost pure socialism. This is money that is coming from, and this is, and if you, we, we didn't really talk about it much either, but I mean, if you look at the, in, in, uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, the inflection point for Poland was when the European Union was founded and when, you know, uh, uh, lots and lots of money started flowing from the richer countries to help build the infrastructure. Okay. And again, so, but that, you know, that's very social. I mean, that's, that's, you know, basically socialism, redistribution of, of money, you know, uh, and, and so, and I think, you know, we need to be very clear that, you know, all of this stuff, all of these projects that we're talking about in terms of economic development and all these things that, that are happening in, in Erie, they are almost solely based on socialism. And the fact that this is all, you know, federal monies that are coming in here, this is not capitalism. Okay, now something capitalistic may come out of it, but it is being created through federal subsidy. Uh, and I think that's really important to understand. Um, and, and, you know, I, there's a couple of other things in here that, you know, I, I, I said, well, you know, uh, uh, and, and again, you know, I mean, this, is, this is a personal opinion uh, of someone who has you know, done a lot of research uh, in these areas. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that they're looking at is, you know, the number one thing they want to do is, you know, build a cluster in plastics. Well, I mean, okay, that makes sense because Erie's number one industry is plastics. Uh, on the other hand, um, if we if we look at, you know, the environmental aspects uh, of, of that and the pressures um, 
that are coming from many, many different groups because of the longer term ill effects of the use of plastics, you know, the PFAs, the forever chemicals that are, you know, now literally found in all drinking water, they're in our air, they're in our land, uh, and they uh, are proven to, you know, increase the proclivity of cancer, uh, liver disease, any number of other things. So, I, 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 and again, I mean, so is plastics the future orientation that is, a, you know, the appropriate one? And it's just a question. Okay, I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, be overly critical here. It's a question. I mean, we read on the one hand that, you know, plastics are literally killing us. Uh, and, you know, the fact that here we want to make an emphasis on that. And I guess if we were, you know, putting, a, and they're going to be putting a lot of money into R&D, research and, and, and development as well. Well, if that means that we're going to be looking at how do we extend the life of our plastics industry by making it more environmentally sound so that it has, you know, fewer deleterious effects on human beings. Okay, that's something totally different. Okay, but to just say plastics, I mean, for me, that puts a question mark. Is that actually future oriented? Is that where we should be? playing our cards uh and and it's a question okay that's all it is um and uh you know um again and we put in recycling plants and technologies well recycling um is you know for anybody who is involved in the sustainability uh and the environmental world recycling is cute i want to say it's you know certainly something that we need to do where we can recycle we should recycle but I mean, recycling is not really a solution to anything. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, <laughs> recycling plastics, for instance, is not really a solution because we're still using the plastics and all those toxic chemicals are still being released into the atmosphere. Um, so, you know, that's not really a solution. Uh, it's, it's a solution, it's a business solution to be able to make more money, you know, within that frame. Uh, um, and you know to reuse you know scarce resources uh, and things like that. That's all great, um, but it is not a solution to a problem. Uh, it's it's just something that we have to be doing. Um, the only other thing that you know here in this in this grand plan that I think is really important to you know look at is in in in, in, in speaking to some of these people. I mean, you know, they say that it's. Uh, it's implied. I personally, um, you know, having been involved in, you know, businesses and international businesses and global businesses uh, uh, during my, you know, uh, industry career, um, if it's not written down, it doesn't happen. And so I look at this, and for me, I look at, you know, so where is the workforce development piece? So because if you start, you know, uh, investing all this money in in industries. Uh, well, if if I'm not investing in, you know, how I'm going to be developing my local people uh, to take these jobs in these, you know, new clusters or recycling or whatever any of these other things are, I mean, there's a lot of infrastructure stuff, which is great. Um, then that means that those people are going to be coming from outside of Erie to get jobs, which means our population will, will grow. And it will look as if, you know, our poverty is going down or our unemployment is going down, but it'll be that same group of people who, you know, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening with any of those people who are here now or suffering in the same way. We will change the statistics, but we will not have changed any of those people's lives. Uh, and, and, and again, I just, you know, I just want to, you know, and, and this is typical. Okay, this is, you know, uh, so much of this is based on a, uh, an old way of looking at things. Um, and, and I think we need to be, you know, looking at what are the real industries of the future. Uh, and clearly, we can't forget about plastics, because that's our number one industry. But is that the industry that we want to look at, you know, carrying us forward, looking at all the deleterious effects that it has? Uh, and if so, then how are we going to remediate that? And that becomes, for me, you know, I, you know, I, I would put, you know, sustainability, you know, at, at a higher, much higher level in all of this, um, simply because that's that's kind of like the source 
of you know what we've got to be looking at in terms of I mean energy is getting less, uh, materials are getting less, we're getting more and more scarce, uh, and so we need and that's what sustainability in essence is. It's how do we use the resources that we have, you know, better, uh, and uh, um, that's that's something that we really need to be looking at. Uh, greatly. And, and, and again, I think, you know, it's really important to understand that this money is, these are subsidies. This is socialism. Uh, and the, the, the key is, is how do we use this opportunity to create something that's going to last into the future and not go away when the federal monies go away? Um, because that's typically what happens, you know, when you know, people lure uh, corporations to come to their uh, cities to build um, new infrastructure and new jobs. Uh, the fact is, is that, you know, after whatever, whatever contractual period that they have, uh, you know, where we give them subsidies and, you know, we give them uh, tax abatement and things like that. Well, when that contract is up, they said, well, what have you done for us lately? And if we don't have a plan uh, to keep them, because somebody else is going to offer them more um, to go there, then we lose them, right? And 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 this is you know kind of the, the game that's being played. And as long as we continue to play that game, then we just become the pawn of the corporations that are moving back and forth to make money, as opposed to figuring out how do we make an organically grown economy here that is sustainable moving forward. Okay, and oh, did I go too fast there? I went too fast. And 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 that being said, we just wanted to take a few minutes here and uh, you know talk about some of the you know big differences. And again, Lublin has grown and been become a much more prosperous city, predominantly based on a shifting of monies from the European Union that have financed uh, all of that. So again. I'm, I am by no means saying that any of this stuff is bad. So do not misquote me on that. It's the question, what do we end up doing with it? And how do we create a basis that, you know, we, we, we no longer become reliant on federal monies uh, or, you know, 10 years from now when those monies run out and those corporations, you know, want more from us, you know, I mean, how do we how do we deal with those things? These are big issues that you know just are just generally never addressed. But this is the reality: those those businesses and those industries will not stay if we cannot continue to feed them better than someone else will, uh, and that's just a harsh reality. Um, and again, we wanted to take a, a, a just a quick moment here. And, and talk about some of the systemic differences. And it, it appears that, you know, again, we're, we're becoming, you know, much more socialistic, uh, uh, um, you know, so we're becoming even more like Lublin uh, because we're getting all these federal monies now. Um, Dr. Kibler, I think Dr. Paziabiak had a question or a comment. <laughs> uh, oh, good. Actually, yes, yes, I've got one remark because um, I think, um, Sometimes we exaggerate, or Bruce, you exaggerate talking about socialism. It probably <laughs> yes, I do. We have, we have different understanding of social, what socialism is in the America and Europe, and yes, especially, especially in so-called post-socialist country like Poland, right? So we are not thinking about socialism if we are receiving some money from the federal government or European Union. <laughs> so that's to be clear, right? And um, I think, I think, uh, yeah, we, we differ probably with our understanding of socialism or subsidies are, but I think in certain circumstances, it's, uh, it's a good idea to develop or to, to give some money for development, I mean, infrastructure and this kind of things, so that to, to build like a critical mass and then situation will, I would say, trigger and develop in the, in the proper way. I, I'm, you know, I've got this European perspective on that, and probably you don't have to agree with that. But it's true. It's true. You mentioned, you mentioned I think European. stimulus is the right word here because it is stimulus. It's a stimulus, and I think Bruce was pointing out like yeah. a short term well, or long term. 
I, um, I, I, it's just important, you know, for people to understand, you know, that it's a, it, this is literally a redistribution of income, which yeah. which is, you know, in its essence, is a socialist principle. Uh, and yes, clearly, and, and actually, yeah, you know, probably that in Germany we are talking about, you know, this social, you know economy something like that so we are talking about economy with this huge component of, of social uh life and and social area okay yes um so yeah we are we are clear on that <laughs> yeah i okay, mean so we can continue with the table yeah okay uh, you know it's just i mean but you know the, i i guess i i, I do ex oh, perhaps over exaggerate a little bit simply because americans don't seem to actually understand these principles at all uh, I mean, yeah. again, I'm not, I don't want to get political on any level here, but if you look at, you know, uh, a lot of uh, disaster relief, uh, actually, um, you know, you look down in, in, in uh, you know, some of the, you know, places that are being hit by huge climate uh, and things like that, and, and a lot of those are, and, and I'm not a Republican and I'm not a Democrat, just to be clear here, you know, I'm not, I am not a party affiliate of any kind. Um, but if you look at it, you know, a lot of those are more Republican states who are saying that they don't want federal government, but then when they have climate disaster, the first thing that happens is centralized federal government funds are then demanded to rebuild them. And then they say, well, we don't want government. But then when there's a disaster, the only thing that can help them is the government subsidies that come in to help them. And, and, and this is just something that, you know, people aren't looking at or understanding. Uh, and and you know the role that government is actually playing uh, in all of this, um, and and I just think it's sad that people don't understand. Government can be a very positive force; it can be also a negative force, but it can be a very positive force. And people don't realize the positive aspects. And this is, you know, if I were to go back to you know the the, the chart before, it's like the amount of positivity that we can potentially produce out of this money coming from the federal government is amazing it's amazing i mean it's like it's, it's a one-off this will probably never happen again the opportunity that we actually have here uh through these federal funds um so it's a great thing but let's do all the, you know the best that we can with it so i see that uh um ms beaumont uh, raised her hand to uh, ask a question or say something well, there are questions from the audience. All uh -oh. right. and we've almost reached the end of our um, a lot of time for program here. So I was just going to ask um, to wrap up your presentation, and then uh, I have a few questions here. Okay. Um, well, Pavel, is it okay if I do this chart really quickly? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And again, I mean, this is really just you know a lot of the the pieces here are about what the discussion that we're having right now. I mean, these are some of the systemic differences. Uh, you know, our poverty rate in, in Erie is 28.5% in 2019. I uh, have not changed a lot uh, uh, since then. 9.1% uh, in, in Poland. Uh, we always talk about free markets, which of course, you know, is right at the core of what I was just saying. Has What's happening in Erie has nothing to do with free markets, okay? This is subsidies from the government. 23% um, uh, of GDP in rising, uh, uh, 30, um, oh, sorry, that's uh, healthcare. 23% of GDP and, and rising, uh, and and um, you know, how long can we afford that? Whereas, you know, look at uh, Poland and and most of uh, Europe, their you know their healthcare costs 8.8% of GDP, and that's because they actually it's a centralized mechanism. It is not socialism. Okay, it's the fact that it's saying. In America, we cherry pick. In other words, when I'm an insurance company, I can say, well, I only want to insure these people because that's where I make the most money, right? And, and instead of doing what insurance is supposed to be, insurance is supposed to balance the risk across the population, not cherry pick a, a specific small piece of the population to make as much money as they can. And there's a, that's, a, that's a, an intrinsic difference between how the system in Europe works and Poland and the system here in the United States works. And that's why they're paying 8.8% of their GDP uh, on healthcare, and we're paying 23%. I mean, it's rising everywhere, so let's not be fooled by that. So, you know, and our out-of-pocket is also considerably more. 
So again, systemic you know differences. Uh, cost per student, you know, in America, uh, you know, it's uh, about fourteen thousand dollars per student, uh, and we rank twenty fifth uh, globally. Uh, uh, and in 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 Poland, Lublin, it's eighty three hundred. Uh, per stu student, and they rank 11th globally. Uh, they're spending a lot less on it, and they've got a much higher ranking. Um, and and that, that's across the board. You know, in almost all of Europe, they're spending a lot less money on everything they do because it's it's it is not socialized; it is centrally managed. Uh, um, yeah, uh, and even you know, looking at the federal tax rate, you know, very very similar in many ways. 10 to 37% in, in, in Erie in the USA and 12 to 32% uh, in, in uh, Poland. Um, and, and it's just, you know, the, the way that they are going about it, I guess a great example is, you know, not allowing Medicare to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I mean, you know, all that means is that pharmaceutical companies get a monopoly on the pricing and there's nothing free market about that either. Um, and, and it's just, you know, these, again, these misconceptions of people in America, you know, about what free markets are, or what socialism are, is, uh, and, and things like that. So, and with that, I believe that that was the last slide that we had. Um, there's a whole bunch of other topics that we were going to talk about, but uh, let's go ahead and take some, uh, some of the questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you for highlighting the trends and developments in both cities. I know we could go on for a lot longer because economy and statistics are an endless uh, resource. So I'd like to just um, ask uh, Dr. Pesiabiak that um, your professor college is back on in a couple of weeks and in fact a bit later than in America, right? I think it's in October, early October. So, um, and we've talked about um, graduation and the students, you have a vibrant city with uh, a lot of students. Uh, where do most graduates go on after they graduate from um, UMCS? Are they staying in Poland? Are they staying in the region? Or they are they coming to America to work? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, well, actually, Majority of our students and my university come from uh, from the region. Actually, not necessarily from Lublin. From Lublin also, but uh, but very uh, from from the from the region. And after graduation, majority of them are going back to their very smaller cities and, and villages sometimes, uh, and so they find uh, employment in in majority of cases in, in areas of the fields of studies, actually. Um, of course, we've got, uh, we've got uh, the situation where our students move to other cities. Uh, for example, after bachelor degree, they, they move to, to Warsaw or to some other uh, major cities in Poland to complete their studies with a uh, master's degree. So there is some, some trend of, of uh, that, that situation, too. Uh, Actually, we've got open labor market in the European Union, so it's for us it's uh, it's free actually to to go to work uh, in in Germany or in in Sweden in uh, each of the country of of the European Union. But uh, to be quite frank, uh, some students do so, not not necessarily a big number of all that. So it, it depends on, on individual individual person, I guess. Uh, yeah. So th this would be my question. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, if, if you want to send me a statistics, I, I'm just interested because we talk a lot about, uh, we, we've coined the term um, brain drain that, um, you know, American, like the universities here, local universities, they provide excellent uh, education and, um, but still, not everyone who graduates here stays in the region because the job market uh, may be more attractive somewhere else. So there are efforts on the way uh, to make sure that, you know, you not only come to here to study, but hopefully stay because we have the same demographic trend as you have mm -hmm. uh, an aging working population in um, So I, I, I'd like to maybe continue the conversation via email uh, if you have any yeah. interesting yeah, statistics. One additional remark here because we 
Could you speak into the microphone? A little closer to the microphone. No? Uh, one, one additional remark uh, I would I would like to, to make is that we have practiced uh, a lot of historians with uh, to our studies even before the, the war in Ukraine started. So it was also like a possibility for Ukrainians to come to Poland and to study actually for free. There are some some conditions. To, right to do there. That. When you turn to the right, your microphone picks it up. Uh, I don't know if does it for work now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, just like stay right there, then it should be fine. <laughs> this is work actually. This microphone. Um, no, we don't hear you right now. Okay, maybe yeah, maybe, right uh, there. Uh, right there. The internet okay. connection is not stable, but I wanted I just wanted to say that um, we attracted the many Ukrainian students even before war started. So uh, it was also like popular um, decision for Ukrainians to come here and to stay here after the studies. So not only in, in Poland, uh, but also in, in the European Union too. So uh, it, in connection to what you said about, uh, about the uh, decreasing population, uh, we also noticed that the of course, uh, the situation where Ukrainians were coming during the, the war or are coming, mm -hmm. actually. So mm -hmm. the number of our citizens increased. And I know that in Erie, you have also uh, some immigrants from, from Ukraine, Ukraine or refugees, better maybe. Uh, but because Lublin is quite close, uh, we are one of the cities that is uh, kind of uh, hosting a, a lot. Mm -hmm. of it's only what, like 160 miles, right? To the Ukraine war. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, right. yeah. So it will have some consequences on our labor market, sure. on our, our studies, and etc. So in, in connection. Mm -hmm. with well, maybe maybe then the next time, because yeah, this is happening or this has happened. Hopefully, will have ended uh, this this war. Then we'll talk about the consequences, and you know, not only for Poland but for Europe um, and the world. I'd, I'd like to have, um, I have a question for Dr. Kibler, also a professor. What advice can you give to students who want to learn about the, about different economic systems? Um, what, and why does it matter? A short reply, we are running out of time. Oh, goodness. Um, oh, wow. Um, well, I guess the first, <laughs> I, well, I would say travel to Lublin. <laughs> I've been there a number of times now. Uh, and the change has been phenomenal over the last even just 10 years. Um, it is it has changed dramatically. Uh, it's just such a beautiful place. Uh, and, and what you know, and, and I say Lublin because I've been there and Pavel is also my friend. And uh, um, but I mean, travel to different places and see how things work there. Uh, if you have the opportunity to study abroad, you should. Uh, and, and almost everyone has the opportunity one way or another. Um, I guess, you know, the economic part of your question is I think the, 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 the most important thing to remember, uh, and, and again, is even as we were bantering about socialism and communism and things like that, or, or capitalism, with economics is philosophy, which means it is a belief system, okay? Uh, and, and as such, everybody's got their, you know, own opinion of how that is interpreted. Uh, and the one thing that you can always take with you about that is as a theory, that means it, it is not 100% correct. It does not always work. Uh, and so, you know, basically, I think the biggest problem with, you know, uh, all of that is that people become very dogmatic when they talk about, you know, uh, economics in terms of capitalism or socialism or communism, we've got, I mean, America has got the largest welfare system in the world. And therefore, you know, on a certain definition, we have the largest socialist system in the world because we're supporting more people. And the other aspect about that is, is that, you know, basically the corporate welfare system is almost twice as large as the actual, actual welfare, welfare system for physical people. 
uh, I think that's you know something to really keep in mind. And 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 so I mean you know okay socialism free markets I, you know it's it's all illusory. It's it, it's it's philosophy. It's a way of thinking. Uh, um, and don't get caught up in in dogma and thinking that a particular thing is the only way. Socialism is not right. Capitalism is not right. Communism is also not right. None <laughs> of them actually work. Uh, <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's why we need young people to um, experience to travel, yes. to study abroad, to um, make their own uh, mind up or understand more about other uh, countries and the way the economy works and their businesses are run. Um, so thank you for that advice. Thank you very much, um, Pavel, for joining us today from Lublin at a uh, after hours. I really appreciate that. So um, thanks, thanks for, to both of you for sharing your research and the great resources with us today. The last chart I can see already like uh, five other programs lined up right there, but we can do that anytime throughout the year. This is this is a lot of fun. Um, this is very informative. Thank you so much for for um, joining us today at the Jefferson. If we didn't get to every question, uh, if uh, or if we have any further questions, audience, uh, please send them to my email, Beaumont, B E A U M O N T at J E S E R E dot O R G, and I will forward those questions to Dr. Kibler and Dr. Pazjepia. Uh, and of course, to all of you watching along, thank you for tuning in. These programs and discussions and the exchange of information ideas wouldn't be possible without you. For more information about the Jefferson, including how to register for additional events, uh, please visit jesu.org and like us on Facebook, like us on Twitter, follow us on Twitter and Instagram and su subscribe to our YouTube channel where we host all the digital programs um, that you can also access them through our website. Um, for the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Angela Bowman. Thank you so much again, Dr. Kibler, Dr. Pazjabiak. Have a great, wonderful rest of the day, and I hope to see you soon again in Erie. That will be fun, and I'm hoping to travel to Lublin, Poland very soon myself. Thanks for listening and learning with us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.